Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here. Welcome to Sea Tranquility and in the Prague Seat. It's Tuesday night. We've got the panel together. Tonight's topic is all about those bands that had a three album run of excellence. And before we get started, uh, I do want to mention that there are certain bands that we have talked a lot about on this show. There are certain bands that they're generally thought of as the legends of progressive music. We all know they've got three, four, five, maybe six absolutely amazing albums in a row. We've talked about them. You know the suspects, Rush and Yes and Genesis and King Crimson and ELP and Pink Floyd and Dream Theater. We know they are automatics. They're the usual suspects. We're not going to talk about them tonight. We're going to try and dig a little deeper than that. And with us today, we've got Louis Nasser, Anthony Ferraro, Armando Venditti, Eric Porter, our center square, George Lamy, Stephen Reed, and the professor of Prague, Mr. Ken Golden. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Hey. Good to be here. Here again. Three Thanks, gems in a row. So uh, I don't know about you guys. I have a long list. I think we're going to do a part two, maybe a part three of this. So for everybody watching, strap yourself in, get a snack, get something to drink. We're going to talk about excellence tonight. So we're going to go Ken, Stephen, Armando, Eric, George, Anthony, Lewis, and myself. George is looking at me like I'm crazy because he's probably he's not looking at the same uh, configuration as me, but that's what I'm seeing and that's what records. So, uh, so that's what we're going to go. So we're going to go one band at a time till we get to everybody's third pick. So uh, Ken, what do you got for your first one today? Okay, so I'm going to dig pretty deep. And this all starts with jazz, uh, actually an American jazz pianist, quite famous, named Mal Waldron. And Mal Waldron, in 1971, he recorded an album called The Call, which was one of four albums where Mal actually plugged in and played electric piano. And accompanying him on the album was a keyboard player, Jimmy Jackson, who was in Amandul 2. He played in Passport. And that's the, that's the preamble to where I'm going. And the band I'm talking about is Embryo, German band Embryo. And uh, Embryo recorded for United Artists. And they recorded two sessions in 71 and 72 that United Artists didn't know what to do with. So uh, Christian Burchard, who was the leader of the band, he was the band's drummer, he gave the albums to Metronome, who released them on the Brain label. So uh, somehow, and I suspect because Jimmy Jackson was a member of Embryo, he dragged Mal Waldron into the sessions. So Mal Waldron is on those two Embryo albums. Uh, they were a very unusual band in that... Uh, they were an underground, you would call them a, a kraut rock band, uh, jazz rock, but there was a very strong Northern African and Middle Eastern influence. So, and that would creep in more and more as the years go on. So for show and tell here, I have the reissue of Embryo Stygos. And that was fo followed by, this is kind of a legendary album, great cover too. Embryo Rock Session. Those are the two albums that have Mal Waldron. And uh, they're basically crazed, crazy albums. Uh, Roman Bunker was a guitar player. He also played Zazz. Uh, just killer underground psychedelic jams. But it had like that jazz rock sensibility to it. And also uh, it was all kinds of other instruments floating in there. All kinds of different exotic percussion. And then after uh, that, the band had uh, American saxophone player Charlie Mariano join. And this was the third album in the series called We Keep On. And, uh, and when Mariano joined the band, he took it even further. Uh, that's when they really started emphasizing the, the, the world music, ethnic element. Uh, Bunker is just kind of like going nuts on the whole album. Uh, it's it's perfect. It's a perfect Krautrock album. Uh, the band is still exists. 
I, I don't believe Burchard's still alive. His daughter, Marja, uh, took over the band. They have a new album coming out in about a week. But Embryo was a great band. They had many great albums. And I just picked these three out of the sequence because uh, they're just awesome albums. If you don't know the band, you really should know Embryo. Very important band. Very cool. Those, those album covers are spectacular, I think. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have Stygos. I have the reissue of it. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, um, there were a lot of musicians going in and out of that band, but, but it was Burchard's band and the sound more or less stayed the same, but it was interesting because you had Mal Waldron. I mean, he's a legendary jazz pianist playing electric piano and you had Jimmy Jackson. He was playing, um, he was playing, uh, uh, he was playing organ, mostly organ, Mellotron, great records great records it just nobody nobody really sounded like embryo then since then other bands have, have been influenced by them cool we're off to a great start all right steven what do you got well i really liked this as a, as a topic for a variety of reasons um firstly because we do our album ranking shows and you just you know you choose your least favorite through to your most favorite but doing this isn't necessarily like that because I found that I couldn't always necessarily get the albums in that I wanted to get in because they didn't follow in a run. And that was an interesting way of looking at it. And I also liked it because I thought with some of the things I've chosen, I mean, anyone goes after Ken is going to look like they're playing it kind of safe. All right. (laughs) I mean that as a huge compliment, by the way. Um, So I looked at this and kind of thought, well, maybe somebody else will choose this band. And I thought, but maybe they won't choose this run of three albums. And I liked that as well, because it does kind of play about with, with what we normally do. Yeah, I'm playing the type. This is a reasonably safe choice. But I think there's an interesting story here because this is a band that went from being, you know, a, a cult act into being a chart act, basically overnight. Household name, certainly here in the UK. And then they went and recorded another album, scrapped those sessions because they didn't like what they'd done, started again and recorded what I think is their best, one of their best albums. And then, and everyone will know where I'm going with this one now, they parted with their singer and continued with another phenomenal album. Now, my least favourite of the three is Misplaced Childhoods by Marillion. So this is the one that puts them over the top. They've got two albums prior to this that kind of, you know, build a huge following. You know, it's some in some ways the rebirth of Prague at that stage. But this makes some, I mean, Kaylee got to number two in the UK, never quite got to number one, was held off for, for quite some time, I think by Vienna, by Ultravox. Somebody will correct me if that's wrong. Um, I bet they were household names, suddenly went, you know, stadium size. Followed it up with Clutching at Straws, which is the album that came after the one that they kind of recorded and thought they'd actually made Misplaced Childhood 2. So they binned all of that. Fish got disillusioned with it, or Too Big for His Boots, depending on what way you want to look at it or what story you believed at the time. They kind of sing off the same hymn sheet now, many years down the line. And then interestingly, an awful lot of what they scrapped appeared on Season's End with Steve Hogarth as the singer. And if you listen to some of the bonus tracks that are on this, you'll discover that they used a lot of the music on here and the lyrics end up on Fish's solo album. So I think it's a remarkably interesting journey. But the consistency throughout that journey is really impressive because most bands, I think, would buckle under that kind of pressure that to some extent they put themselves under because they couldn't quite get themselves out of that funk of we've recorded an album that's broken us, what do we do now? And then it all implodes, took them ages to get a singer in place. And then, although he doesn't now, he needed a hand to write lyrics and various things like that too. But to record three pretty phenomenal albums in that sequence means it's a safe choice for me. And yeah, I talk about Marillion a lot, but I looked at this and thought, I can't not. So that, that's that's my first choice. 
You know, they were on my big list, but I really struggled with which three to pick because I'm like, well, I have to have misplaced and clutching, but I have to have script. But Fugazi comes in the middle. I could do Fugazi, misplaced and clutching, but then how do I leave out script? And I can't do the first three and leave out clutching. So I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm not going to pick them. <laughs> That's, that was the easy choice for me. I was like, all right. Done. <laughs> well, well, it's well, when, <laughs> when I looked at these and I kind of thought, well, you know, I might be choosing something that somebody else is going to choose here, but they might not choose these three. Right. So right. Yeah. I'm also quite pleased that I went quite early because even if they have, I still got to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, Armando, you're up. Well, um, <clears throat> when you told us the topic and then you said to me, you know, when you met, when messaged and said, it can't be the usual suspects. I thought, shit, what the hell am I going to do here? Right. So um, I looked into my music collection to look at stuff that I haven't heard yet. Right. Which is a lot guys. It is. Um, so my first one is um, jazz fusion uh, artist, Billy Cobham. So I have the Atlantic Years box set. So I dove into that and I chose the first three. Um, and Spectrum, you know, right out of the gate, I mean, for me, it's just my God, you know, Quadrant Four, just what the hell am I listening to here, right? Because um, like, he was signed to Atlantic and like in, in, at that point, Record companies were basically saying, you know, you want to bring a camel into the studio to get you, you know, inspired to do whatever the hell you want to do, go ahead and do it. You know, just give us some product, right? So, I mean, that album, <clears throat> you know, is just amazing, right? And the, you know, the players he had on there, Tommy Bolin, um, you know, Lee Sklar, um, John Abercrombie, I believe he's on there too, um, if I have my notes proper. Um, just an amazing, an amazing album. And then he comes up with Crossroads or Crosswinds, sorry. Can't even read my own chicken scratch. Um, just amazing. What I, you know, the first side is, you know, a five part suite, you know, Spanish Moss. What I like about albums is they take you on a journey from, from start to finish, right? You get lost in it, right? It doesn't matter, you know, your ass could be on fire. You wouldn't care because you're enjoying the music. You're enjoying what you're listening to. So th that album is fantastic. You know, he has uh, John Amber Crombie on there too. He's got George Duke, the Becker, the Brecker brothers. Sorry, I can't speak today. Um, you know, the track Heather, for example, it's just beautiful. Just a gorgeous piece of music. Um, and then you follow that up with Total Eclipse. Right, another like out the door, right? Just gone piece of music. Like the entire album is great. You know, you have, uh, you know, you even have the, the 10 minute, 44 second sea of tranquility. You know, so much for a shame, guys, right? <laughs> there you go, right? <laughs> it's really good. So, yeah, I just, at that point, he, he, could have done anything he wanted to do and he was he was allowed to do it right and anything he touched turned to gold for me anyway from my opinion so those are my first three can't go can't go wrong with any of those and billy's the early early years of billy cobham solo man poof killer great choices great choices <laughs> all right we're off to a good start here our center square mr porter good evening everybody um for my first choice, I started thinking based on the topic and I said, I'm gonna maybe try to steer away from the seventies a little bit. And this was one of the bands that I discovered and it's kind of nice to grow with a band, um, discovered them fairly early in their career. And to me, it was kind of one of those things where it lit a little, little light, like there are bands out there, there's bands that are being signed, bands that are doing music, touring. So my first choice is Echolin. And I'm going to start with um, May, and that is their one song, 45 minute, whatever it is, 46 minute piece of music. And 
from there, I'm going to The End is Beautiful. Um, I believe that there's kind of a span. A uh, couple of years, Eklund's not the fastest working band in the world, but, um, and I believe that leads into um, Eklund. Um, I, I love these guys. I love pretty much everything they do. They have changed a lot over the years um, from their early 90s stuff, which was a lot harder, faster. Um, they kind of pulled the reins in a little bit as they've matured, I guess, if you want to put it that way. But pretty much anything they've done for me um, just hits home. So I could have picked any three, but those are the three that I went with for this. Yeah, I mean, I give you kudos for not picking the start of the catalog, right? Because that's the obvious choice there yep. and, and greatness. But those three are really, really good. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Lewis. Already, you already, already stumped me, here. dude. <laughs> <laughs> all, 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 I, all I want to say about, uh, I think the choice is perfect, obviously, right? But um, I just, I just want to add a little dimension to this because I've, I've known these guys for many years. I've been friends with all of them except for Paul, who's no longer in the band, but I don't know why, it just never worked out. But um, when they first did this and they, they played it live at Nearfest, um, I was I was in attendance and I was extremely drunk, among other things. And, um, <laughs> Sean, that was, was, that was a two in the afternoon show, I think. They <laughs> well, you know, what does that it's, matter? It's, 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 it's an that, appropriate it, time somewhere matter. else. It's always beer o'clock at Nearfest. This is true. And um, and I didn't know that they were going to play this thing. I didn't even know it existed. So they just went ahead and, and they were killing. And then they stop and then they bring out all these musicians. Yeah. And then they, they started playing this. And you wouldn't believe how pissed I was. Because <laughs> I thought this is like the most pretentious move ever. You guys are killing. What are you doing? Right. And um, Raymond, who's a great, great pal, he he came after the show and he we're talking. What do you think? And I, I just I was reading the riot act. And he just gave me, this is a copy he handed me personally. So just, just listen to this and tell me later when you're sober. And it took me a long time to just find it in my backpack of all the, the near fest stuff that you get. Yep. And then I, I have been on a, on, a, on a constant apology tour about this record for, for, for many years because I think this is, this is my personal favorite of their catalog. And um, when I've seen the footage of their show, they, they killed it. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they did. But yeah, I love these guys, you know, Chris, um, Ray, all of you guys, if you're watching, Brett, cheers. Yep. You deserve it, man. Can't wait for the new album, guys. So That's uh, right. Let's, let's 20, 20, 2029. Yep. <laughs> all right, George Lemay, what do you got for us? My first one's a band from New Jersey that I got. Uh, I'm going to recommend from Ron Thal on Facebook. Right when the first album came out, thank you, scientist. First one's called Maps of Non-Existent Places. I knew when Thal's putting his name behind something that it would be quirky and it wouldn't be boring, that's for sure. And um, one of the twists for, for prog metal is that the lineup, there's a violin player, a sax player, and a trumpet player in addition to the standard uh, metal instrumentation. And uh, also the singer. The singer has got a, a high tone. It's, he's not trying to do high screams, just his general tenor is, is quite high. But he's got beautiful melodies and the music's very adventurous. That was 2012. 2016, they do this one, Stranger Heads Prevail, which if uh, you saw the homework I gave to Rand. And then 2019, they do a double called Terraformer. She didn't really need to be a double. It's barely over 80 minutes. But that's kind of like a thing now. Mastodon just did it too. But uh, this one's real sprawling, a lot of different kinds of material. They do an instrumental on every album, which I quite appreciate. And uh, just the consistency of their records, high energy, uh, never a boring moment. So I went with Thank You, Scientist. Cool. Good luck, man. <clears throat> As Chris Allo would say, the music is batshit crazy, but it works. Yes. Tom, 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 the guitarist, Tom Londa, he, he got insulted when I told him that Sal, the singer, sounded like he was like an emo singer. You know? <laughs> I said, I said, he's a great singer, but he's the wrong singer for the band. What the fuck oh, no, no, Sal Marano is great, dude. Yeah, I you, know. love, you love him, but 
Oh, His tone is unusual. All right, Anthony. Great choice. Uh, for my number three, uh, I'm going to uh, Germany. Uh, this band uh, has a leader. And over the years, interchangeable members, but there's always the one constant, the leader of the band. So I'm going with Eloy, with Frank Barnaman as the leader. And I'm going with the three-year run of Eloy Dawn from 1976, Eloy Ocean from 1977, and then finishing up the trilogy, uh, Silent Cries and Mighty Echoes from 1979. Now I call this the trilogy because all three of these are the same four-member band with Jurgen Rosenthal on drums, Klaus Meitzel on bass, and Detlef Schmitzen on keyboards. I'm butchering their names, but who cares? But uh, in my opinion, okay, this is the best things. run of the band. I, I think this is where they were top shelf, uh, very spacey, very Floydy. So if you're into that kind of music, these are the three to get. Eloy Dawn from 1976, Eloy, Ocean from 1977, and Sound Cries and Mighty Echoes from 1979. Yeah, that's a good run right there. I mean, you could, you could, I mean, that's probably their most prolific run and their most polished run. I think the three before dawn are also really good too, but it's yeah, they're good, but they're not that. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, that's that's the earlier, a little more raw Eloy sound, but still great. Yeah, that's good choices there. Good stuff. All right, Lewis. All right, so for this assignment, I decided I was not only not going to go old school, but I was going to pick only things that were from the 90s and the thousands and forward, right? Just, just to keep it another thing. So my first choice has already been scoped, so I'm going to have to pull, a, pull a, an audible later. But um, I want to begin with a, a, a fusion band from Hungary. Um, this, of course, uh, Special Providence. These guys are awesome. They're a little bit more on the rock side than the pure jazz side. Um, they have a lot of keyboards. They have a lot of shreddy guitars and metal, but they also have you know more conventional instrumentation, drums and bass. It's all instrumental. Well, they, they do have some little singing here and there in the last one. So the run of albums that I want to talk about begin with this one. This is Soul Alert. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely on fire. This is kick ass, take no prisoners, amazing, this record. Following that, a couple of years later, they came out with Essence of Change, which is following in the same formula, but they are now a little bit more refined. So they, they I think they rely more on arrangements than just like Shreddy to, to get, you know. And then the, the third one in that run, which is the, the most recent one that I have, it's called Will. Again, I it, the best thing anybody could do would be to listen to it. This is fusion with a lot of balls and a lot of very creative writing and arranging. These guys, they're they're very, very good ensemble players. Um, and um, they, they, as far as I know, they've only once come to the US and they played of all places at Rossfest. I didn't go, but um, I, I, I still, I, I, I considered it. I thought I would spend the money just to go see them because this is how much I love this band. And I would highly recommend anybody who doesn't know these dudes, Special Providence, this three album run. It's all from the 2000s and um, check them out. Their, their band camp is, 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 is fully stocked and you were, you, you're probably gonna be surprised. You know, it's not, it's not your traditional fusion. But it's awesome. Hey, Luis, didn't they break up and then just reform? I think they're they they, they they got a new bass player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, as, a, as you know, man, it's tough to keep it together, right? But but yeah, they they they're back. Their first two, I thought I, I think all their albums are good, but the first two, I the way I hear them, they were a fusion band. You yeah. know, it's kind of you the know space cafe and the other one, right? Yeah, Whatever. yeah. And then and then it seemed like they just sort of turned it up a notch, got a little heavier. That's I don't right. want to call it metal, but no, but they're, but they're rock. Definitely, there's a lot more rock in the. Yeah, the first two albums had a little bit of a refinement to it. I think, yeah. George, would you agree? Totally. Yeah. The Soul Alert is like the transition album. That's a mix. Yeah. 
the last two, they, they have their genty moments now. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's talking about like more, more bowl heaviness kind of. Yeah. Yeah, the last two. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I got to invest. They also have lots of really cool electronic sounds in the keyboards. They're not just like Hammonds and, you know, Moogs. They have, they, they, they really have use a lot of textures along with the genty stuff. Because I don't want to, I don't want to self-promote, but the label accidentally shipped me, double shipped me Will. I'm sitting on about like 50 copies of Will. So if anybody needs copies of that album, <laughs> buy them. I have it in stock. That's a good album. Yeah. Well, there you go. There's everybody's first choice of where to start with that band. So uh, and Kenny, no, it's, they're a good band. And to get con- for me to get confirmation from George, that's like, you know, <laughs> that's you know, that's like yeah. the rabbi. That's like the rabbi telling me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for my first choice today, again, I, I had a, a really long list of bands that fit into this format. So I just kind of like randomly said, all right, I'm going to pick whatever. I picked an artist here who it's possible that someone else on the panel has also picked this guy, but his catalog is so enormous that really he's got three album runs all over the place in this catalog that, that you could pick and nobody would be wrong and they'd all be great picks so uh frank zappa is my first choice for today and i decided i was going to go with probably my favorite lineup of frank's which is uh the band that produced overnight sensation apostrophe and my personal favorite one size fits all so this is George Duke and Ruth Underwood and the Fowlers and Napoleon Murphy Brock, the whole crew, uh, essentially like probably one of the hottest fusion bands ever. Uh, and, you know, they adapted to Frank's grand compositional skills and all the zaniness. And you've got some, you know, Inca Rhodes and Andy and, uh, you know, St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast and 5050 Zombie Wolf Montana, all sorts of great songs on here. There's some amazing Frank Zappa guitar solos on here. George Duke, some of his best playing is on here. I love Ruth Underwood. She does so much in this band. And these albums are so listenable. They're challenging musically, but yet they're presented in a way where it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I could have picked like, I mean, there's the, the, the couple of instrumental albums that came before this. There's the albums that came after this. There's the early 80s albums. There's the stuff from the late 60s. You really can't go wrong with Frank. And there's so many three album wonders in a row. But I decided uh, this is probably my favorite. So there you have it. Uh, Overnight Sensation, One Size Fits All, Apostrophe, three absolute gems in a row. That's my first pick of the day. He, uh, back in 2015, uh, for the 40th anniversary of One Size, Dweezil did the whole album in its entirety. It was pretty badass. I can yep. it's, a, it's such a great album. It's so he's great. got some instrumental albums before these, the ones that you... Oh, yeah. Okay, I got to do some digging. Okay. Yeah, those they're kind of like <laughs> almost like big band jazz albums. They're uh, terrific. They're fusion. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So good. Bob's gonna kill me, but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> I'm gonna start looking. Really good stuff. When, once you go down the rat the Frank Zappa rabbit hole, boy. You, that's, you're that's never coming scares, out. You're never that's coming out. Sca- <laughs> it scares the shit out of me. That's that's what scares yeah, the shit out of me. It's like, oh my god. Deep. It's gonna scare the shit out of your bank account too. Yeah, yeah. Did I wait? Oh, please, that's not good. There's all the live albums, all the great live albums. And then yeah, don't dip in the live archives. You'll be there for hours. I actually have the uh, the Roxy recordings that the the seven Roxy and elsewhere. Yeah, Roxy and elsewhere. I got the box set. Good, yeah. Right, good. which I have to sit for like a week and a half and really dive into and listen to it. So yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but yeah. It's, yeah, the Zappa universe is, is ridiculously large. So it's a lot. Yeah. All right, back to Ken. All right. Well, I guess I, I'm getting a little commercial here with this band, with this pick. So uh, I'm going to talk about Leorm. Uh, they are an Italian band that started out as a beat psych group uh, in the late 60s. And then their first album was at Glorium, quite quite rare. Their first full-on prog album was this one, Collage. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Leon was a trio of Aldo Tagle Pietra on bass and vocals, Michi De Rossi on, on uh, drums, and Tony Pagliuca on keyboards. Collage was taken right out of the nice and ELP songbook. It was, it was mostly Hammond organ, tight rhythm work. Pagliuca, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Aldo Tagle Pietra, he, he makes like some strummy strummy on the guitar. Great, great singer. That was always sort of the focal point of the band. Uh, but it was that and Hammond organ. And the band got very popular. They were probably the third biggest Italian uh, prog act behind Banco and PFM. But they didn't really get much attention outside of Italy because Aldo sang in Italian. And then a few years later, Charisma signed them and did a English language version of Filoni Serona, which I'll mention in a second. So after Collage, the band came out with Woma di Pesa, which is an absolutely mm. stunning album. It's just, there's, it's just more expansive. It's more mature. Pagluca uh, is now using Mellotron and also Synthesizer. Still plenty of Hammond. Uh, Aldo is now also playing electric guitar, but it's much more of a, a keyboard dominated sound and it's one of the best prog albums from italy from the 70s and you like mellotron great great record so then they came out with the album which is really their magnum opus the one i just mentioned and that is felona e serona which is a concept piece about two sister planets one eternally happy and one eternally sad and um kind of a strange album because I, I find the production to be a little dull but it's a very dynamic album it's extremely bombastic uh the tension just kind of builds and builds and it just comes to this fantastic climax and uh it it's uh, it's it's one of the great italian albums and then what happened was charisma records licensed it they hired peter hamill to write lyrics english lyrics and they and all those things in Italian, it kind of sucks. But if you have to hear, if you have to hear it in English, then that's the way you hear it. Uh, that's the way to get it. Uh, you know, the band really at that point, they they pretty much broke free of the ELP comparison. They just kind of had their own sound. Uh, they were they're really one of the greats. Uh, Tagli Pietro was one of the really great vocalists from the prog scene in Italy, and. Uh, and I guess he just wasn't comfortable singing in English. So they, they kind of went back to singing in Italian and uh, they, never, they never really uh, branched out beyond Italy, which is a shame. They, they were great. Those albums are beautiful. And I would, I would say the one thing that sets them apart from Bonco and PFM, they're all bombastic and symphonic, but there's yeah. like a romantic element of Leorme's music that I think you don't hear as much in some of the other bands. And that may be because of Aldo, I think, you know, yeah, I think so. He was a, he was a great singer. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's easy to kind of, because they were a trio, it's easy to say they were like an ELP knockoff, but they really weren't at all. Yeah. And, uh, it, there's something about these Italian bands from the seventies. There's a, I don't know if it's like, I hate to say like classical element to it because it's, you know, cause that's, that's, that's kind of easy with Bonco, but uh, it's just a sound, you know, they, what do they call like RPI rock progressivo Italiano? You know, it's, it's, it's like when you hear this, is such a thing? <laughs> okay. when, when you hear these Italian bands from the seventies, man, you, you just, you just, you know it when you hear it. Yep. That's right. yeah. mm -hmm. Great singers. Oh, 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 great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And great so, that's sort of, so that actually, you know, that was the thing, you know, they, they expanded, they, they, they kind of got shitty. I, I think, I mean, they added a guitar player uh, around 75 and they went out to record in Los Angeles and sing in, in, in Italian, but just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't particularly good. They, they did make two very interesting albums in the late seventies, all acoustic albums. There was uh, Florian, and Piccolo oh. del Rhapsody. Yeah. Two, those are beautiful, really refined albums where they decided they were going to make, you know, progressive music 
within an acoustic context and it and they're great and then then they i mean they like a lot of bands they became very commercial and the albums are they're nothing to speak of and then they later on when they played at near fest for example had a totally different lineup aldo taglio pietro and I, I think it was i think uh mickey de rossi i think was still there and they made some really nice prog albums they went back to the old sound but they had two keyboard players if i remember yeah and they, yeah and they were good they were they were very good albums they were Orm albums but yeah. uh, you know the 70s for me those those early albums were you know where where it's at yeah good stuff good man <clears throat> yeah yeah oh yeah well that's true that i mean it was really a it was really a five album run because <laughs> contrapunti well contrapunti was great just yeah. as good as as any of these, but I had to pick three, right? And I actually kind of like the live album, which is kind of a strange album because it has a sidelong track with a stupid name of Truck of Fire. <laughs> it's a miserable sounding live. And he sings in English on that side. The other side, he sings in Italian. And uh, and it has miserable production. But still, you know, shitty Le Orme was better than most bands, so. Yeah, good point. All right, Stephen, back to you, number two. Well, it's already been mentioned about kind of bands that we grew up with, and that's where I've gone with the next one. But choosing which three was really difficult for me. So I could have started with this, but it's not an album, so you can't start there. <laughs> You'd be able to show it anyway, though, isn't it? <laughs> And I could have started here, but I decided not to. I decided to go for a slightly more controversial era because th this is my favorite Queen's Rick album, Rage for Order. I mean, other than the back, the back is glorious. I mean, look at this. I mean, what on earth is that all about? I mean, you've got to love the pomposity, the ridiculousness of that. I mean, Jeff's head is nearly square here. I mean, that's that's a work of art. Those are very, those are very sexy women on the back. Right? Oh, sorry. Steven, you know, oh, for the longest long time, I never knew going to get closer uh, to you was a, was a cover. I had no idea. I always thought yeah, that was a tune. Yeah, uh, Da Bello, Lisa Da Bello does the original. Okay, I I, I just found that I just found that out recently. Yeah, and here yeah. I always thought it was their, their tune for decades. No, no, and, she did it in 84, just quickly. And Mick Ronson plays on it with her. And at the risk of talking about the wrong albums, the evolution between here and there is ridiculous. I mean, it's almost like two different bands entirely. Yeah. And this is heavy and it's in your face and it's daring and it's trying lots of different things. And there's an element of scene chasing here. And I'll still tell you it's my favorite Queensryche album. But from there, they explode. They have hit singles and we get an overblown but really pretty fantastic concept album and for its age and its time I mean, that's ridiculous so, you know to be doing this as the music scene is changing 80s into 90s is just that's suicide is it not but it's not no because it absolutely broke them ginormous yeah how do you follow it well you follow it with a strange progressive commercial album which I absolutely adore. I adore Empire. Is it my favourite? No, Race for Order's my favourite, but that three album run makes no sense really, and especially to have taken it to the success that they did. And I also like Promised Land that comes after that. And oh, yeah. you can see them going up this hill and they get to Promised Land and it's like somebody just takes all the land away from them entirely because they just do they that. Plummet. It's the strangest kind of turn of events, do you know? Because there's such a, at the start, there's a gradual climb and then it just woof straight up through the stratosphere and then straight back down again. It, it's a strange run of albums, but these three, I think, are just utterly outstanding. Just fantastic albums. It's Queen's Rights, my second choice. My, my favorite tour of theirs was the Promised Land tour. They, yeah, they, were, they, they were just playing so well for that tour. They're just killing it every night. It was amazing. Yeah, I saw them in Glasgow on that tour and they were just ridiculously good. Yeah. It's just weird how they followed up their most commercial album in, you know, uh, Empire with an album that's really not 
that at all. It's a pretty daring and dark album. And people were kind of yeah. like, hmm, you know, and again, look at the time. It's early 90s already, right? Yeah. So if things are changing drastically. And then they said, all right, well, that didn't work. Let's just kind of follow what everybody else is doing. And then the album after that, which was god awful, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw See, I like hearing the Now Frontier. Do you? Oh, yeah. I liked it. Dave Ragsdale plays on it. Yeah. Yeah, but so my, wow, I'm gonna run out and buy it now. They they actually did a cover, they actually, actually did a covers album. album. And they actually did a covers album. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is not yeah. very good either. Oh, yeah. but after that, it, um, it the, just, their cover of Innuendo was pretty good, but I right. don't I don't like the covers album, but my controversial choice for what I do like is American Soldier. Go figure. I really like that album. I, I just, <laughs> Most people make that face job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can't appreciate that. <laughs> I, I just remember buying Promised Land and thinking, okay, Empire was so good. Buying Promised Land and listening to it and hearing, okay, I am I, the, the lead off single. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this is good. But the rest of it was like, huh? Like, it was just like, no. When is it going to kick in? When is it going to? I really like the album. It's, it's deep me. and it's dark it and it's intricate. And it, I mean, it, as Peter says, it's of its time because they're dealing with social issues and various things like that. Yeah. I, I have no problem with that because it's actually handled quite sensitively on the album. But mm-hmm. it's the age old problem of do you repeat the massive success or do you try something else entirely? Yeah. And they try something else entirely. I quite like it. It wasn't successful for them. And from there, it just seems to spiral out of control. And the next tour I saw them on after um, the Promised Land tour was an Operation Mindcrime 2. And at that stage, it was all imploding on stage and everything. It was just very... But did they need to do an Operation and, and Mindcrime 2? Like, that's... That was them grasping at straws. I mean, they just yeah. were trying to do anything that would, you know... And it had become almost kind of amateur dramatic or sort of theatrical stuff on stage. People chasing each other about with giant syringes and kind of, <laughs> kind of going... I have no idea what I've paid to see. <laughs> yeah. It's, did you ever see the, the cabaret show they did? No. Cabaret. Oh God. It, it, that, that, look it up on YouTube. Oh, well, I I have to, that, that was right before that, Jeff left. Yeah, that was, yes, that that was bizarre. Was horrendous. Very bizarre. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, need to, I need to go and spend some time watching something I'm going to. <laughs> Let, let's know how far you get into that because you probably you probably won't last too long. <laughs> no, no, don't waste your time. Just just get a dose and then cleanse. But it's, gonna, it's gonna make the other stuff seem a little less silly. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know they right, did it. Come on, though, you're up. Okay. Um, my second choice is IQ. Nice. And I'm, thank you, Stephen. And then, then I'm going to start from um, Dark Matter. Um, I believe it was from 04. Um, just, just a fantastic album. Just, you know, c- complex arrangements, intricate guitar work, keyboard work. Um, m- you know, typical prog album, five tracks, five is all you need. The longest is 24 minutes, 29 seconds. That's the last song. It's like Sepper's Ready on Foxtrot, you know? Um, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, uh, what I tried to do because what I tried to do was pick, because I know they had a singer before, Peter Nichols. And I tried to pick albums that were consistent vocally in terms of the same vocalist um, to give it almost sound like, I guess, give a bit more continuity in terms of the vocal style and, you know, I guess what I'm used to. But um, they followed that one up with uh, Frequency, which featured Andy Edwards on drums. Um, Again, a really uh, fantastic piece of work all the way through. Um, again, they're very much like Genesis, I find, you know, um, in terms of their arrangements and just their playing style. Um, and then after Frequency came The Road of Bones, okay, which I watched when you were doing your Halloween um, shows, your 31 albums. 
Pete, and no matter what anyone says, you did a fantastic job, and I loved every episode. It was fantastic. And I'm not sucking up either. So, um, <laughs> um, but The Road of Bones, it was basically a concept album of um, the life of a serial killer, okay? Dark subject matter, yeah. um, very dark subject matter. But basically, uh, the lead character is saying, this is who I am, this is what I do. You're not gonna change me, you're not gonna cure me. I don't wanna be cured. This is what it is. You either deal with it or you don't, right? But um, yeah, it just, and again, Peter Nichols is on, um, on vocals and Paul Cook came back on drums for this album. Um, one track, um, Without Walls, at one point sounds like Afterglow from Genesis, from Wind and Weathering. You know, just, and listening to it, <clears throat> that one track, sorry, it, it, it brought out a lot of, of, of emotions, just, just the arrangement, just the way, the way he sounds, the way he sings. He's very emotive in his singing. Um, yeah, just those three albums, like one after the other, fan freaking tastic. So, and I would recommend them to anybody, anyone who wants to get learn, you know, get into different music, or if they haven't heard uh, IQ, please invest your time. You, you haven't spoiled one of my choices for today, but for a follow up show, that's one of my choices gone. IQ and those three albums, absolutely spot on. And I would say it's a great choice and you could start with three other albums as well, because that's how strong the catalog is. And especially the catalog once Peter Nichols came back and replaced Paul yeah. Manel. And it's, there's a long run of albums now that have been spectacular and you could pick any three of them in a row, in my opinion. Though That's a great start. I mean, those three are excellent albums. I think they became a stronger band this Nichols second time around. I absolutely agree with you. Yes. you know, the first, you know, those first couple albums to me are like legendary, but I think yeah. consistently they have just been knocking it out of the park. Yeah. Oh yeah. Starting Subterranea. I mean, oh, Subterranea is great. Yeah. It was great. But even like Dark Matter, they, yeah. Yeah, they, they were a band that I never, they were never really much on my radar. I mean, I had those records back in the day. They didn't really do much for me, but. Well, I, I had the world of bones. Sorry. So I can. Yeah. I had the road of bones. I bought it on Pete's, you know, show. We were recommend, recommending it, you know, when he did this Halloween shows. I'm listening to this and I'm just like, what the hell is this? Like it's that good, yeah. that melodic, that symphonic almost. It's in terms of the arrangements, in terms of everything, just overall. Um, and I went back and listened to Dark Matter and Frequency. I'm like, Okay, this is something I can really get into and really enjoy. So, those are my three for the second one, second choice. And they, they are another one of those bands that can do like, you know, these double album sets and they're not boring at all. I know. <laughs> you know, I know. You know, when Martin Orford left, everybody thought, oh my God, that's going to be the end of the band. And it was like, the albums are solid. Yeah, was after he left. Yeah, absolutely. I was worried, but it's just has continued on at the same standard. Yeah. Really impressive. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Good choice. Glad to see IQ here. All right, Eric, our center square. What do you got? I'm going back to the well for this one. Um, another Nearfest alumni band, and it's Happy the Man. And I'm going with their self titled and Crafty Hands and Third Better Late. And outside of their spinal tap drummer situation where they were changing drummers, you had a solid lineup. Um, top-notch musicianship. And when you actually listen to Third Better Late, I believe Eye of the Storm was used by Camel on I Can See Your House From Here. It's a Kit Watkins song. But for a four track recording of demos, they're, they sound you know, really good. And you're talking about back whatever, 78, 79, when they recorded those. Um, and it's just, they're, they're a great band. They could do anything. I mean, they even got, you can do, they could do fusion. They were heavy. I hate to use the term, but they could even be a little new agey at times before that got a bad connotation. I mean, spacey, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
and obviously I've mentioned them a number of times here, but I love that band. And it, to me, that's a great string of three albums. Very consistent, well played, well recorded. Obviously the Arista albums are very well recorded. Um, so that's my number two. The band that should have been big, right? Should have, would have, could have. Good Agreed. Job. Stuff. And I do like Crafty Hands. I do like the album aside from track five with the vocals, but I do I'm sing the out. Al- <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying the and not, then I will shut up. The it's good to hear Armando. We got the it. album is very strong. Um as a whole piece. So yeah, it's it's that it is a good album, Crafty Hands. Good stuff. All right, George. What do you got? All right. Number two is from Germany. Um, they had a debut album that was a uh, good but fairly unremarkable funk fusion record. Then they come out with this in 2008. Band is Panzer Ballet. This is Ooh. called Starke Stücke, which translates to strong pieces. Um, they leaned into their heavy side here. They got a second guitar player and they're, upon the request of their label head, they decide to throw on some covers here. And band uh, leader slash guitarist Jan Zerfeld, he's half a fusion kid and half a metal kid. He, he likes tribal tech, he likes Meshuggah. So they end up doing covers like uh, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, then they do Weather Report and the theme from the Pink Panther. I mean, it's all over the place, the covers. And when they do covers, it's not it's far from faithful. They, they, he, Jan reharmonizes and rearranges. It's just very creative stuff. We follow in 2009 with Hart Genossen, which translates to uh, Enjoyed Hard. Basically the same formula, but it's the proverbial Turned It Up A Notch album. They're covering the theme from The Simpsons. Uh, there's a ABBA cover, a Zappa cover. Uh, they throw in a vocal track on here. That I could probably do without. It's like extreme vocal vocal track. And they end the trio with this one, Tank Goodness. Again, leaning into what they do, the heaviness, uh, the occasional covers, and a couple vocal tracks. One of them with uh, Matthias Seiflin from Free Kitchen. That's a re- actually a real good song. And uh, again, with Wrecker Brothers, uh, Giant Steps, Take Five. I mean, just real creative takes on stuff. And their originals are very, very good. Uh, consistently entertaining, high energy. You, you won't be bored. You'll hate it or you'll like it, but you won't be bored. Ponser by that. Good band. George, did you see them? Did you ever see them? I did not, no. They've never been here. And I, I know they were by you in 2012. I saw them at the New Jersey Prog House. Yeah, that was, was good. Consider the source. Hmm? Was that with Consider the Source? Might have been. I don't remember. But um, but the thing I was surprised about was Jan mostly played rhythm. Yeah, he's not much of a lead player. He yeah, played. the other the other player played his dick off. Yeah, he's like a like a kind of like a Greg Howe clone. Really good. Yeah, he did his what? He played his. His dick off, literally, man. It just fell right off. I knew <laughs> you you like just that. got the weirdest look from Bob right now. He's right over here watching. He's like, he, he, he did, did not use the dick. He used his dick. I mean, you never seen just, anything like it, man. The guy, his penis just fell right off. It's that so hurt he 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 it. I, mean, <laughs> I should mention, too, Panzer Ballet and Thank You Scientist, they've had problems <laughs> keeping personnel. I mean, the band changes on every CD, but... Sure, the penises keep falling off. Can't tell. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He's got this obsession with penises for some reason. I don't. <laughs> okay. Only when detached. Yes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, okay. where are we? Uh, Anthony. <laughs> uh, for my number two of a three album run, uh, we're going back to, we're going to the UK. Uh, band was formed in the early 70s. Their, their debut was released in 1973, which I really enjoy. But the next three, what can I say? Camel Mirage, 1974. Camel Theme from a Snow Goose, 1975. Mm-hmm. And the cap off, the epitome of Prague right here. Camel Mood Madness, 1976. 
Uh, what can I say? Led by Lord Latimer, Andy Latimer on guitar, Barton's on keyboards, Andy Ward on drums, and Doug Ferguson on bass. Uh, just, just fantastic <laughs> symphonic prog. And if you're looking for, I mean, most people out there who are watching our show know who Camel is. But if you don't, and if you're looking for a, a David Gilmore type tone, right here it is. Andy Latimer is the man. So I'm going with the Camel series from Mirage 1974 with their epic Lady Fantasy. 1975 Snow Goose, where it's just tons of instrumental and flute orgasm. And 1976 Calmating with uh, Moon Madness from 1976. Great. Hey, Anthony, being that you're into Canterbury so much, what do the Sinclair records do for you? Are they still pretty high for you? Really? They're okay. They're not, okay. they're not. So, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I can't imagine a bass player leaving a band could have that effect on a band, but it did. But I have to say that uh, they came back strong in the 80s. I love Stationary Traveler. Yeah, those all have their moments, those, those 80s. Though. I dig them. I like well, the and then I like the pressure the points. The, the two CD pressure points that I bought from uh, Dr. Prog at Laser Edge, just killer. Cool. I'm glad someone picked Camel. They were on my larger list, so very good. All right, Mr. Nasser, we're back to you. All right, so this is a band that I am a very, very big enthusiast of. Um, I don't normally hear them mentioned in these programs and by most Prog fans, which I think is a shame. Um, I am talking about Intronaut. It's a prog metal band. And um, this particular run is all only after 2010. So you begin with um, Intronaut Habitual Levitations. Then my personal favorite, okay, Shape of Things to Come. This is, uh, is ridiculous. And then finally, we have... Uh, Fluid Existential Inversions. This is their most recent one. This is where they actually decided to just go ballistic and throw everything in it, right? They, they really run the gamut of styles and arrangements. The, the thing that kind of ties this group together is the fact that it's, it's melodically and harmonically led by a, a guy who plays fretless bass, Joe Lester. And it's, it's unusual to think of fretless bass in the context of like prog metal, you know, not always, but this guy gets a really, really great sound. It's just driven by dark glass and some filters and he just kills on all of these records. So for the disclaimer, of course, is that it has some, you know, death growls or whatever, some rough singing that some people hate. Right? George is out. Yeah. But I will say though, that there are also Me lots too. of very, very brilliant instrumental passages. Right. And in any case, I think that if you just think of the of the vocals as you would a guitar with a distortion pedal, it's just a different texture. It's not really, you know, it's not it's, it's not it's not something that I will wilt over. I, I actually dig that sort of thing. But um, if people are not familiar with this band Intronaut, I would very highly recommend that you, you get the, the last three in order. So yeah, habitual my back account. Yeah. They're really unique band. I, it's like, an, yeah. I'd almost say prog metal even kind of maybe doesn't even describe them. They're yeah, because they do have a lot of unusual structures, right? They're yeah. not, yeah, they, these guys are doing their own thing. I love them. You can tell when you listen to, because I remember the first time I heard Intronaut, I'm like, you know what? I, th I bet you these guys in their early, early formative times were probably kind of like this sludgy hardcore band but they have an appreciation for jazz and prog. And then there's post-rock stuff going on in there. And it's very complicated. It's not quite math rock because it's very atmospheric at times. Really, really different stuff. Yes, I, I love them. I think very early in their career, they, they, they met or were like taken under the wing of one of the guys in Tool, kind of opened some doors for them. And that allowed them to, to establish a pretty solid touring career. And you know they're great. And it's another one of those things. If you have a chance to see them live, please take it. You know, it's not, um, there's 
nothing quite like seeing a band on stage for you to really get a gauge of who they are, right? Yeah. Especially nowadays, because people record at home, you can you can do whatever you want, right? Yeah. But yeah. if you actually go and see them live, and they can transmit all that emotion, and they can really put it together, that's that's a fantastic experience. And these guys take us and take names, intronaut. So, kind of, I like the way you kind of segued here for me about going to see a band live and really kind of fully getting them. Uh, I liked this band before I saw them live, but we've gone to the near fest well a couple times today and I'm going to do it now as well. So uh, there's this band from Sweden that released a couple albums in the early nineties and they were part of the whole resurgence of progressive rock and, you know, the seventies style music. And I remember being blown away by them back then. And then they disappeared for a number of years and then they played at near fest and then they came out with a new album, like a decade or so later. I'm talking about Anglegard. I and knew it. Typically, Hybris, the one, I mean, the, the first two albums are so great. Epilogue, which was supposed to be the final one. And then they come back with, how the hell you say this? Uh, Viltens Olga, many years later, which, you know, I remember when this first came out, I was like, I really like this a lot, but it's not quite as great as these two. But in subsequent years, this is damn good. All these three are amazing. And, you know, the first album has some Swedish vocals, but I think kind of like Lewis said before, some of these bands, when they don't do a lot of singing, when they do throw the, vo the, the vocals in, they treat it like another instrument. So you don't even, it doesn't even matter that you don't understand what they're saying. It's just so, it just mixes in with the rest of the instrumentation. And with this band, you got <laughs> Metatron Galore and Hammond Organ, Rick and Backer Bass, Electric and 12 String Guitars, um, electric and acoustic guitars, uh, just amazingly complex kind of pastoral music, figure like a head-on collision between Gentle Giant, Gabriel Era Yes, I mean, Gabriel Era Genesis, a little bit of Yes, a little bit of Jethro Tull, and lots of King Crimson, uh, but then other stuff on top of that, just magical, beautiful music, that you almost feel like you should be sitting out in the woods listening to uh, while the sun's going down. And just, I, I, I'm still as enchanted by these albums today as I was almost 30 years ago. And uh, I can't recommend these highly enough. Uh, Anglegard from Sweden, amazing band. When you mentioned Sweden, I knew where you were going. I just, you know, I had a few, I knew it. It's like, okay. <laughs> and and you're gonna see them at Prague Fest in, out in LA? Uh, I don't think I'm going to LA, no. <laughs> no, you know when they played oh, them. Oh, did I? Oh, back then, no, I did not, no. No, I only saw them the one time at Near Fest. They, they played in 90, I guess it was 93 in the 90s. That was the live album recorded there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. And I remember, I remember sitting in the hotel room with them, helping them. They shipped Epilogue over. And I think Greg got a bunch of jewel cases and they were sitting in the hotel room, just assembling Epilogue so that I could sell them at the sell them they, they sold out they sold they sold an insane number of cds at, at, at the uh at the festival um, right yeah yeah they were fantastic and then you know they were great in your fest you know they were great seeing the new jersey Prague house because you get to see them up close you know in a tiny little room they were great. that must have been wild yeah so and so the one there was post matthias though right that the new drummer yeah yeah it did, didn't matter yeah it was great all right ken our, your final pick for today Anthony, you better get a pillow because I'm going long here. <laughs> Luckily, I'm on a cushion, so I don't. I can so, get so I'm I'm going to tell I'm going to weave a little tail here, because the band that I'm going to talk about now is actually the band that caused me to start a record label. Ooh. And yeah, so I'm going to tell the story. So uh, I had started Laser's Edge, and I had been doing it for a couple of years. And there was a CD reissue that I came across of the Spanish band Gothique. And it came out in, uh, it was available in Japan. And I contacted uh, the Japanese distributor and they said it sold out. But you should contact the label Movie Play. And the Movie Play was the breeding ground for all the prog music in Spain in the 70s. All the great bands were, were on Movie Play. And uh, I contacted them and because of licensing issues, they couldn't, they couldn't sell me Gothique, but they said that they would custom make CDs for me. So 
I said, any anything from the catalog? And they said, sure. So I came up with the idea to make a CD by this band, Granada. And they manuf Granada made three albums and uh, and movie play, people behind movie play, they designed custom for me a uh, two on one CD, which was the second and third Granada albums on one CD. And also while I was at it, uh, the, the Eduardo Board album, which you guys may know, uh, they made that for me. And it was basically a horrible experience. <laughs> they, they made the CDs for me. They came out ugly. They didn't sound particularly great. They cost me a fortune. I was living, I was living in Hoboken at the time in a, in a, uh, in a condo in a second story of a, of a, of a three-story walk-up. And I had a thousand CDs delivered to me by Emory Air Freight. And I opened up the, I was super excited. We carry all these CDs upstairs. We crack, I crack open the boxes. They were just thrown in. Oh. <laughs> they were just thrown in there in the jewel. Nice. Half the jewel boxes were cracked. It was just a miserable experience. Nice people, but they sucked. And I said, I could do better than that. <laughs> and the, I said, first of all, it would be cheaper if I do it on my own and I'll do a much better job. And that's what caused me to start the label. So, so here's the story with Granada. So there, they were, they were, the band was based out of Madrid and they made these three albums and then they disappeared. Uh, the band was led by keyboardist uh, Carlos Carcamo. The first album had vocals. It's called Hablo de una tierra. Luis, you could translate. I speak of the earth. There you go. And uh, it's probably the, the lesser of the three, but it's still great. It's like a mix of Gothique, which, you know, I mentioned a few weeks ago and everybody kept saying, what the fuck did he say? What what, <laughs> what that band called again? Right. So it's a little bit like Gothique, a little bit like Triana and a little bit like Koto and Pell, which I've also mentioned in the past. It's is uh, it's very Prague, but you also get Spanish folk and flamenco uh, elements. And there's a lot of Mellotron on the first album, actually on all the albums. So if you're a freak for that, like I am, then, you know, you got to hear this, this band. Uh, Carcamo plays a lot of flute and he also plays violin, which turns up. So, so habla de, de un, una tierra. Is, oh yeah, sorry, you said una tierra. I speak of a land. Yeah. Right. That was the that was basically their calling card. Their second album, España Año 75. Luis, how did I do? Very well. Very, very well. Right. So the band went all instrumental and Carcamo started playing synthesizer. He added that. So it got a little bit more of like a symphonic palette, but it still had that folk and flamenco influence uh, influences going on. Uh, you reminded a bit of Camel or Gothique. Carcamo basically takes center stage on the album, they're, they're, but there's plenty of guitar, a lot of guitar on it. Um, if, if you like Moon Madness, Era Camel, that would be something, you know, it'd be an album you want to check out. And then their third and probably most interesting one was their third album, Valle del Paz. Luis, please. I can't read it. I, I, I didn't understand. Oh, I'm sorry. Did. Valle de, del Paz? No, uh, Valle del Paso. So the, the valley, the, the valley, Valle, Valle del Paso de la Paz. Valle del Paz. Uh, Valle del Paz. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the Valley of Peace. Okay, there you go. So uh, Carcama, he changed the lineup a little bit, but the sound was pretty much the same. But he added a bagpipe player uh, <laughs> who pops up now. And, yeah, well, and, and so there's like this Celtic folk influence on the album and you know they they were three great albums and it, it, as i said a few weeks ago with gothique they were probably the best spanish prog band but granada was not far behind and uh, yeah they made a they made three great albums and uh, i think they're all essential especially the like the last two all instrumental so i think uh if you're if you're foreign foreign vocal phobic like some people i know uh, 
<laughs> you should uh, check the. You should check out the second at second and third Granada albums. I have the third one. That's quite good. So I will. I will. Two thumbs up for me on that. Anyway. What is the name of the third one again? Sorry, Val del Paz. Here, I'll hold it. Val del Paz. Hold it up. Yeah, Val Del Paz. See it? Yeah. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Peace Valley, basically. Yeah. Somebody in the comments is going to say, "What was the name?" So, <laughs> guaranteed. Yeah, the other thing is, I'm not sure if that is in Spanish or in Catalan. Well, okay. well, you know, I can, I can, I can piece it together, but you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, it's. it's yeah, really, all the great, all the great Spanish prog came out of movie play. Right, gorgeous stuff. All right, Stephen, you're number number one or number three, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have them in any particular order, uh, other than the first band I chose were kind of the the bastions of prog as the '70s moved into the '80s in Marillion. With Queen's Reich, he kind of had something similar as the '80s moved into the '90s. And with the last band I've chosen, it's as we moved into the 2000s. Now, I would have mentioned this theme earlier had I noticed. <laughs> I've only just realised that that's what it is. So it sounds like some grand plan, but it's a complete accident. Um, so the last choice that I have is probably, I've been racking my brain as I've been thinking about this, the only newer, and we're going back 20 years plus for the formation, UK prog act that I can think that I've seen doing stadium size shows. So for that, they deserve it. And I will admit that my own journey with this band is one where, because they were quite mainstream in the success that they gained quite early on, I was like, <laughs> I don't need that. And then I really started to listen to them and thought, get over yourself, the music is good. So. I'm at Muse is where I am. Okay, so you've got Origin of Symmetry, which was followed by Absolution, which was then followed by Black Holes and Revelations. So this is a band, and it's something I've touched on on shows before, that I don't understand why the masses get Muse, because they hold all of the elements that make prog so underground in the UK that we're still digging to try and find it. So, you know, they are bombastic. They are over the top. They play complex music. They do have choruses that you can sing along with, but there's plenty of bands that you can say that about that have never managed to kind of get themselves on the television and play on chat shows and things over here. Um, they have odd lyrical themes you could argue that Mark Bellamy, the singer, is a bit of what I would call a snooker loop because some of the theories and some of the nonsense that he comes away with, that's a kind way of describing it, but it makes him interesting and it makes him quirky and he's good copy in the press. And they just seem to have played a really clever game that they have very quickly, <laughs> and he's off again, very quickly. Where? <laughs> fall down the rabbit hole again, dude. Uh, uh, they, they very quickly seem to go from being a, a small band playing just in their local area into a band that I'm seeing, you know, international acts come play at the Hydro in Glasgow, and they're filling it. But they play really over-the-top shows. I'll admit that really since this, you know, there's one album after that's good, and then they have rapidly, in, in my humble opinion, disappeared up their own arses um, and are looking for something that is just not there. But people still buy it and still like it, so it's maybe me that's wrong. But when they announce a tour, I'm first in the queue for tickets because it's an event, it's a, it's a show, they have effects, they have massive models on stage and things that fly above you. I mean, it's lots of tropes we've seen before, but it's updated and it's modern. They've got like 70-foot holograms. It's phenomenal. It's everything that the masses should go, what is this shit? It's utter garbage, but they love it because it's fantastic. So my last choice is Muse. You bring up a great point. So why does why is Muse so popular and yet the Pineapple Thief and Spock's Beard and so many of these other bands that have 
equally great catchy songs and complex arrangements and why don't they catch on why i mean i i, I never I, understood that i don't think they're equally catchy i think um i think muse has a they always like you know major keys and they, they like uh the way that i kind of think of them i'm not i'm not a huge expert or a fan but to me they they kind of have elements of of, of of Queen appeal. Well, that is true. Yes, yes. And then they also have elements of Coldplay, and they kind of they kind of weave them. So then that gives them a lot of leeway to then go batshit crazy and do the rest of the stuff they do. Because otherwise, if they started playing more darker keys or started doing more, you know, I don't I don't think they they would have the same across the board appeal. I think that they just they really tapped into a happy vein. And, they, and it's sincere. This is what they do. So they, it's sincere. I yeah. would suggest that they've also been quite clever and calculated. Do you know the first album has a cover version that has that you still hear on adverts and, and things yes. like that over here. Um, they have they courted the press over here that bands, the other bands that Peter's mentioned, never really have. They were in NME. They were kind of cover stars on these sort of magazines. They very quickly managed to get themselves in front of an audience that most bands that are playing a similar-ish style of music yeah. just wouldn't have entertained. And all of those bands have now spent an awful long time going, we're not prog. No, we're not. We're not prog. We're not progressive. We don't play that kind of music. Muse never needed to play that game. They never needed to deny what they really are because no one ever really noticed that exactly. that is what they are. And that Calculated, clever, lucky, I don't know. That is the major difference for me is they've never had to be prog deniers because nobody said, you're a prog band. Plus, their bass player is a very, very good musician. Yeah, so the well, guy kind of holds the heaviness and the yeah. elaborate part of the music. Yeah. I you know, chose him in my top five bassists for, for that reason, yeah, because yeah. he's just... It's, uh, it's, uh, so in the, in the darkness behind everybody's line yeah. of sight, there's a dude working hard. Yeah. And the other guys just sort of sit on top, and uh, I, I, I've always, I've always loved that formula that they have for that reason because they, they just, all the, all the questionable bits, are in the lower frequencies. Yeah, always. I so, think as well. Though, I mean, they've been, they have been clever because you can go to a Pineapple Thief gig, and, and I love that band. Okay, and Bruce Seward will stand and he'll say, right, let's clap along with this one, and the crowd are kind of going. You go to a music gig and it's all. <laughs> but what's happening underneath is yeah. much more technical, much more varied. But they give people something to really latch on to That's and say, right. "You know what? We'll play what we want. You just clap the beat." <laughs> That's exciting. Exactly right. what, what's on about Pineapple Thief is for them to tour America, they had to put the uh, pr professor behind the kit. That's how they got to tour America. Because without without him and without him in the band, they're not coming to America. Why is that? Why is that? Anthony, when I talk to the pineapple thief, how many bands? Because I don't think they ever tour other than other than Nearfest. I don't think they ever toured America until Gavin Harrison got in the band. Yeah. How, how, how many? Gavin bands? It's always, it's always the pineapple thief featuring Gavin Harrison. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. How many bands out there have actually given their drummer equal billing? That that doesn't happen. Do you Absolutely. think Gavin Harrison? It's rarely happened, yeah. Is a magnet? Heck yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. No, I'm asking. I'm, I'm not right. I'm so insulting or anything. I'm asking. Well, well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I will, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and no circles. Why do you think Steve Wolves have brought Porcupine Tree back together? Because everybody yeah. wants to see Gavin. Yeah. I don't know. No, because, I mean, I, I don't. I, I, I don't think, think that's why. That. But I would think Stephen Wilson would be as much of a draw. For pork pantry as as a drum like as Gavin would be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, if he's Gavin well did known, a, he's yeah. well known too. So a, a solo Gavin tour would not sell like either one of these two. That's just a fact. I, I mean, I'm not saying this to hurt your feelings, Anthony. No, but it's a fact. It, and it uh, wouldn't. I, obviously it wouldn't, because no one's gonna pay. Well, I would. I've been to drum clinics and various things like that, and they're great nice out. Sure, but this is not I mean, amazing, I'm not, not, but it's a drum clinic, it's niche. <laughs> Okay. We're, we are all ready fringe animals. Right? Oh yes. <laughs> However, if you go down, we don't the, represent the norm in any yeah. in any in any category. If you if you go down the the YouTube rabbit hole of the things that Gavin Harrison has been involved in, 
you'll find that he gets quite star billing in all of these acts. There are videos of just him playing. You can choose Gavin Cam on the Pineapple Thief Blu-rays because the guy's outstandingly good and they've tapped into the fact that there are idiots like me that'll go, I'll watch him play drums for two hours. <laughs> Man, God, God forbid you go to the concert, you'd be in it, sitting there in a room full of drummers just watching this guy. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I did that with Teddy Bozio. <laughs> uh, I did go see him uh, play a kit that I could barely fit into my house um, for, for an evening. And Greg Bissonette was another one. That was a different show entirely. He was an entertainer. Very good behind the kit, obviously, but two very different nights. One guy take himself remarkably seriously and another guy telling stories about Dave Lee Roth. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree, though, that Gavin Har Harrison is the guy that everybody wants to have sitting on the drum kit. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's yeah, it's a great drummer. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure that I'm not sure he's that big a draw relative to Pineapple Thief coming over to the U.S. Well, yeah, over, I... over here, when they play shows, they are the Pineapple Thief. When they play in the U.S., they are the Pineapple Thief featuring Gavin Harrison. But why is that? I don't... Because, because they believe that the acts that he's involved with... So well, because they think that they're going to get... Crimson, they think that they're going to get the rub. They think they're going to get the rub off of King Crimson. That's of course right. they do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, he's, of course he, he's the known... He's the name. Yeah. Okay. For what it's worth. I mean, yeah, nobody knows Bruce Sword here. I mean, that's... You know, that's yeah, Bruce Sword played a solo show at Proctoberfest and there was nobody there. Nobody cared, right? I mean, I was there, but there were very few people. And, and the other thing is the Pineapple Thief is a band that has evolved a lot, I think, um, through the years. When I first saw them live, they played many, many years ago at one of the first Ross Fests. I saw them. Yeah. And um, that was not a good show. I fell asleep. Made up. But then they, they sort of found a formula they, they developed, and then they've, now they're great. But, I mean, first impressions do matter, right? So it's, um, it's, it's a strange thing, and I, I'm really happy that they're getting some, some traction, but it's not like an immediate home run. Oh, Pineapple Thief. Oh, it's been a huge journey for them, but that's, that's a different discussion altogether. It's been a huge journey. You used to only see their name in certain magazines, and that's where they sold their albums. And beyond that, they got no coverage whatsoever. It was just little niche record stores that they'd obviously gone and negotiated. Would you take our albums, please? And the band at that stage was really one guy, and from there, they've managed to get themselves decent deals. And now, up here behind me, they've got four disc box sets and things like that that come out for every album. And I mean, there's another one down there that I only just bought the other week. So they were, they were always <laughs> they've always been perceived as a porcupine tree knockoff. Yeah, and it was a period of time when they probably were. To be fair, I mean, even down to the, you know, uh, PT pineapple thief porcupine tree. Yeah. So that. I'm not saying they haven't evolved since then, but, but that was always the that was always the stigma that was attached to the band that they were like porcupine tree. I don't want to say light, but they were kind of like a clone. Yeah, I, there was a lot of that aimed at them. It's probably why I first picked up the music. <laughs> I'm going to start getting text messages from Bruce Seward. <laughs> oh, well, I love like, what are you trying to do to me? <laughs> We are we are covering a pattern here. People have frail egos. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce, my email is pepardo at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, before we move on in very quickly, what I'll say about Bruce is if you watch any of the interviews and documentaries and things on their releases, he does not have a fragile ego. <laughs> First person he'll take the piss out of is himself. There you go. That's the way it should be. All right. Armando. I guess that's what are we up to, Armando? Yep. All righty. Your final pick. Uh, my final pick is Frost. Ooh. Um, like I said, I looked into my CD collection. I had the, I have the 13 Winters box set. And I agree with Pete. I don't know how the hell you can manage that thing to, to open it up and look through it and, you know, deal with it because it's so big and expansive. It's like 
Forget it. Um, <laughs> you know, I already had a whole conversation on that. He kind of likes it. I'm like, where the hell am I going to put this damn well, thing? Well, I'm of your belief. It's like, where the hell am I going to put this it's thing? It's beautiful. Here? Don't get me wrong. It just doesn't match anything else that I own. It's a, it's a, it's fantastic looking. And it's, you know, it's very detailed. But it's like, uh, how can I, I physically handle, handle this? Right, you got a whole shelf of those. They go here, things. miles away from everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. Um, Okay, the albums, well, they have only have four studio albums. Uh, I picked fr um, from exper Experiments in Mass Appeal onward. Um, again, very intricate, uh, intricate arrangements, fantastic keyboards from uh, Jem Godfrey on them, and uh, Fantastic guitar work from John Mitchell on the albums. Um, Experiments and Mass Appeal. Um, I gotta say it's, I do like it, but I gotta say it's my least favorite out of the, the three that I listened to that I picked. Um, the next album, they followed it up with fa uh, Falling Satellites. And from the research I did on um, um, sh well, shorter tracks, 13 tracks, shorter, in duration in terms of the, the length of songs. Um, the album was inspired because um, Jim Godfrey's dad passed away during the recording of the album. So the album basically touches on life and how life is very fragile and, you know, don't, how can I put this? Don't hold back on what you wanna do. If there's something you wanna accomplish in your lifetime or in your life, do it, don't, don't put it off, you know? Um, Again, fant uh, fantastic album. Um, I, not, uh, boy, too many tracks to really go through to say, you know, like, do I have a favorite one? Um, they followed that one up with Day and Age um, in terms of a stereo album. Um, what, my favorite. My favorite album. Uh, the title track, you know, uh, terrestrial there's not much you can say it's a, the, this fantastic arrangements again uh, very complex uh passages um my favorite track on the album is uh two of the tracks sorry um kill the orchestra and repeat to fade which you know just Amazing. And if you listen to the vocals between Jim Godfrey and uh, John Mitchell, I couldn't tell who was singing like on lead. Like I really could not tell. The, the vocal style is so, to me, is so close to one another. Like it's so identical that there was um, a, there's a documentary that they have on YouTube of them record, of replaying some of the tracks in the studio. I'm like, okay, is this Jim singing? No, it's John. It's like, you couldn't tell, right? But just an amazing, an amazing group. Um, I'm surprised I didn't, you know, discover them earlier, like, or really listen to them earlier on. Fantastic al albums. Um, but yeah, Day and Age is my favorite one uh, out of all of them, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a bold choice for Frost. And as Stephen and I found when we did our album ranking, we, we were completely different in our perception of these albums and our ranking of these albums, because you can really, you get the four. Stephen's probably in shock that the first one wasn't picked here, right? But, you know, and, but you can, any of them, all four of them are great. So where do you start there? It's like, hmm. And I, I mean, I agree with him, Armando. I think Day and Age is absolutely fantastic. I, I like it quite a bit. Um, you can't go wrong with you could start the first three you could do the last three i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i mean like what again what i like about <clears throat> again with fast this continuity in terms of the band members right i mean like because you can follow the progression in terms of from experiments and mass appeal to day and age and they to me they just keep getting better and better right now like you with you pete maybe my favorite will, will flip, will change tomorrow or next week. But I mean, damn, <laughs> I just, I, I enjoy, I enjoy this group so much. Yeah, it's, you know, like, yeah. it's just, they're, they're amazing. They are, they are an amazing group. 
And it's I'm surprised that they're you don't hear about them as much in North America and Canada. Like you you don't. And I'm surprised that you don't. Like it's 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 odd. Really odd. There's yeah. a really good continuity across the catalog with, with the band members. What I do like about D and Age is Craig Blundell was was a drummer prior to they kind of split, said they wouldn't come back. Then mm -hmm. D and Age appeared, and there's three different drummers on that album. Yeah, yeah, and they said they had they, they, them they, to they, throw different textures in there, and it's quite brave in the sense that they, the three drummers and I forget who the three of them are off the top of my head. But yeah, they, because it, we yeah, like because they said to them, "Be yourself." Bring, bring what you bring to this. Otherwise, there would be no point having three different drummers on it. Right, yeah. Well, then if you get, different textures across the album, and it's a real strength of that album. Yeah, if you're going to if you're gonna say to, to a drummer, this is what we want you to play, this is how we want you to sound, might as well just do it, have a drum machine. You know, just program it yourself. And, you know, if you're telling a drummer, and I didn't know that, thank you for, for telling me that, Stephen. If, you, if you're telling a drummer, Play what you feel, right? Bring what you want to bring to this. Show me what you can do, right? How can you go wrong in that? Because the person's going to say, okay, he's trusting me. The drum is going to say, he's trusting me to do whatever I want to do on this track, right? And I'll, I'll bring my A game and see what, see what we can come up with. So, yeah, um, they did say that they didn't have a permanent drummer uh, for a day and age, so they, they had the three of them coming you know, interchanging, right? I just, I think it's an amazing album. It works. I think we'll, it's an we'll amazing see them album. next year. I don't actually know who the drummer will be. That'll be interesting to see. Just a word of caution from experience. There is an element of danger when you tell a drummer, just play what you want. <laughs> okay. You know, I understand right. what you're saying. I just want to add that sometimes it can be a bit much. Yeah. So you have to pick and choose, right? But but drummers are wonderful. This is This is my... <clears throat> This is my bread and butter as a bass player, but yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah, sure enough, sure oh. enough. <laughs> yep, but the, those are my three choices, so. Cool. All right, Eric. Well, <clears throat> I got a lot of threes tonight. Obviously, we're doing three bands. We're doing three albums. I'm going with a third Near Fest band, and I'm going with a third American band. And this is another band that just, when I discovered them in the 90s, it was another thrill to know somebody was out there doing great music. And we've kind of crapped on them the last couple of weeks. Not necessarily, but Neil Morris is, we've teased him a little bit. So I'm going with Spock's Beard. I'm going right from the start, the light, uh, beware of darkness and the kindness of strangers. I love this band. Um, I'll be honest that when Neil left, I didn't continue to follow them. I think I bought the first two after he left. I don't know. I just felt like it wasn't the same. I didn't think the writing was as good. But the time that he was in the band, I just thought he obviously he's he's great musician. He writes great music. Everything has been very catchy. Um, they rock. Obviously, they're progressive. I thought, you know, I know a lot of people will cop on this, that, and the other thing, but I thought they had a pretty distinct sound as well. Um, Miros always stands out to me as a bass player, um, Neil's stuff, and even his brother, Alan, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of his guitar tones, but when you hear Alan Morris, you know it's Alan Morris. Um, but I really love everything they did, even Snow, which got, you know, was a little long for me. I still thought it was a really good record. Um, so that's my choice for number three is Spock's Beard. Cool. Can't argue with that. I would say, Eric, if you haven't really kept up with them, all the albums that they've done since uh, Ted Leonard has joined on vocals have been really, really good. Okay. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I like them better than the, the albums with Nick on lead vocals. With Nick, okay. Yeah. Nick is a great singer, but I just think that they were going for a more kind of mainstreamy sound when he was fronting the band. And then yeah. once Ted came in, they went back to the... Uh, yeah, Fox Beard of old. I haven't heard any of the Ted. I think it was what was it, Feel Euphoria and something else. And I, I don't know. I just didn't care for them. So I kind of, I went, I followed Neil um, for the most part. I kind of lost track of his last couple too. But um, I'll check out the Ted Leonard stuff. Yeah. The Oblivion Particle is quite good. Yeah, and also the the Nocturnes and Sleeps and the, 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 that also has some writing by Neil. Goes yeah. back to do some writing. Okay. You know, they, they do. They've 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 gone through a long arc, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
All right, George, your final pick of the day. Uh, mine is from Japan. Uh, they're the third, fourth, fifth albums in their discog, a Japanese power trio called Fragile. So this is Downside Up. This is No Wet, 99, and then Five from 2000. This, they're like machine-like precision. Their first five albums are in five consecutive years. They all have eight songs. They're all 40 minutes and change. There's not a, you can't skip any songs on them. They're all extremely consistent band. Um, they show a lot of different styles within the fusion genre, but uh, the records themselves are contained very well. I mean, they're, you can re reliable when you get their albums, you know, you're gonna, if you like it, you're going to, you're going to like it, all of it. And I want to say uh, rest in peace. Their drummer died yesterday. Kozo Suganuma, a big drummer on the Japanese fusion scene, but uh, succumbed to cancer yesterday at the age of 62. So rest in peace, Kozo. Amazing. Yeah, fragile. A good band. I, I could never get those CDs to sell. Yeah, nobody knows them. No, I just, it was impossible. You'd write to them and you'd never hear back. I have some of them for myself, but I would never have them to, I never wanted, uh, and I was never able to get copies to sell. Japan's best secret. Yeah. That's too bad, man. Anthony, your final. All trip. right. I'm going with my number one. Uh, I may be cheating a little bit, but uh, this, uh, this solo musician used to be a part of a, a band that was a part of the big five. So I'm going with him. Voyage of the Alkalite, 1975. Please Don't Touch, 1978. Spectral Mornings, 1979. A three-year run by my Mr. Virtuoso, my all-time favorite guitar player, Mr. Steve Hackett. Oh, uh, reliable. Recorded while Genesis was on a hiatus because Peter left and he was sick of Tony's bullshit. Just kidding. No, you're 1978, not. the first album after he left Genesis with a bunch of great musicians, Steve Walsh, Richie Havens, and Luis Nazar. Spectrum Morning, 1979, he assembles the band, and, he, and, and just fantastic stuff. So I'm going with Steve Hackett's uh, Triple Play from 70, 75, 78, with, with guest star Luis Nazar, and 79, Spectrum Mornings. Anthony, throw Defector in there, too. We'll do four for him. That's four, there. Eric. I don't cheat. That's that's four. That's, that's right. That's four. That's right. We're doing three. Okay? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what a stretch. Never a dumb moment, guys. Eh? It is a crazy good run. Yeah, I would agree. I would Very agree. good. Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> All right, Lewis. Eric, you know I love you, right? I do. We're good. <laughs> Unmute, just to yeah. clarify. Um, as much as I would have been kick-ass at that time, I was eight years old. So that was another, not me. But the, one, the records I want to mention for last are, um, I know a lot of prog fans are going to start slapping around the floor, yelling like Leatherface. But um, I think that what I'm going to say is exactly how I see it. And I don't think the fact that I, I have known these guys for more than 20 years and I have toured with them both in Mexico and Canada, should discount it. I am talking about a band from the Detroit area called Discipline. Matthew Parmenter, um, Paul Zenzel. Uh, the, the original guitarist was John Preston Buddha. And of course, my brother in arms, Matt Kennedy, right? And yes, I am gonna start with the reissue of Unfolded Like Staircase. This is the album. It has been remixed by um, by Terry, Br um, you know, the Rush guy, Terry Brown. Terry and Brown. Um, this is the booklet that comes with it. This, these are like some really cool old pictures. So back from when I met them in the 90s. And for me, and this is, again, you know, we all have our opinions. But for me, Unfolded Like Staircase is not only their best record, but is one of the best records ever made by anyone. In Prague. I love this record. I'll defend it to death. I absolutely love it. And when you actually hear it, 
in this format, what I discovered, this is a record that's lived in, in me and is part of my the, the soundtrack of my life for the last, you know, from 98 to the present, basically, right? And um, it was discovered that there were a lot of things that had been recorded that had been just muted. That were not in the original mix. So a lot of new things have happened. And this record is, is really coming to its own. I mean, obvious complaints were the drum sound of the original. I think we can all agree it was a terrible sound. But it, it, it was not enough to mar it in any way. But now it's like an entirely new thing. You may have think, you have been living with this for a while. Maybe you've never heard it. But this is the thing you want to get now. So I, have a, I haven't cracked mine open yet. But it's amazing. It's I, the, amazing. The original album is like a classic of that era. I mean, yes. but can you imagine? I'm, I'm telling you, it's actually better. That, that's what I've heard. I was like, everybody's like, you, as much as you think you, you know and love Unfolded Like Staircase, wait till you hear the new remix of it. I'm like, okay. And then, um, you know, the years were not kind to the band. John left. There were all kinds of issues. But then his place was taken by Chris Heron from Tiles who has now sort of settled into his role as a, as a lead guitar player for Discipline. And then many years later, they released this to shatter all a chord, which I absolutely love. It's, 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 a, it's a very good record. It has, what, what I like about it is that it has some of the songs you used to play in the old days, where they just redid them and, and, and recorded them properly. And then they wrote some new ones. And finally, the last record that they put out, this is the one that we toured with them in, in Canada and Mexico, is this guy over here, you know, Captive of the Dark um, Sea, wine, wine Dark Sea, yeah, Wine Dark Sea, yes, this guy over here. And this, this has got some incredible, incredible music. In particular, I love um, Life Imitates Art, Here There Is No Soul, and Burn the Fire Upon the Rocks. This is a great, great album. And it, it has that, that added dimension of, of, of a more technical guitar player, more in mean, Chris Heron, but also not using like his big rack mount effects that he would use with tiles. Like when you see him with them, he just has like three or four pedals on the floor and he's just jamming and it's, it's a beautiful thing. So um, this, this upcoming Saturday here in Chicago, they're gonna be performing um, their new record. I'm going to be out there just to see them because I haven't seen them in such a long time with the pandemic and all this. And um, I just want to give a shout out to my friends and this great band who I think um, more people really need to discover if you haven't heard them. You will not be disappointed. Really, these guys are great. Good choice. The last, that last one came out on a great label. That's right. <laughs> I, there's some dude I know. I, it's almost like I, I can see him, but I can't recognize him. <laughs> I think oh, we're laser that. promotion. Yeah. Oh, look, I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing, I'm not doing uh, Ken's advertising for him because he doesn't need my help. But the reality is that, <laughs> no, I do. that, that I these, know. these records are, 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 are going to be classics of the future for a very good reason. So I would, I would, I would highly recommend people who are enthusiastic about, about progressive music, to just realize that there's a lot more than the fucking seventies, right? And I think it's a, it's a very good thing to just test yourself. Go go listen to something fresh, right? Because you always have the old records. You can play them anytime, right? But there are people who are trying to, to, to make new things happen. They're trying to do their own sound, their own interpretation, their own vision. And um, I think they deserve people's attention. And these guys in particular, I think, are phenomenal. So I'll check them out for sure, Luis. Thank you. These guys are awesome. Awesome. I could have gone the other way. I could have gone into the, you know, push and profit and chaos out of order. But I think this is a direction where they really are in, a, in an upward, you know, yeah, upward path. And I do want to say, in addition to discipline, Lewis mentioned uh, the great band Tiles as well, who are also very good. I would say if you like crunchy, aggressive prog with, with a little bit, little rush influence check out tiles really good band they have a number of really good albums as well their last one pretending to run i think is what it's called the uh, it is beautiful and yeah. you know for the guys who always need guest stars you know mike portnoy is on it and even mike portnoy's kid is on it and, you know there's a lot of you know chris is a 
for those who don't know him, you know, he's a, one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. He's very, um, very understated and he has a very dry sense of humor, but he's a super talented and su super sweet guy. So people who know gravitate toward that sort of an attitude. Ian Anderson plays on it. There's all kinds of yeah. like, like heavy hitters on that record. Oh yeah. And um, it's, uh, and he's about to release a solo album as well. But if we're going to have part two and three, then maybe we can go there, right? Yeah, never know. Yeah, I, I've I've heard the solo album. It's very interesting. And it's very good. It's very cool. Good. It's not tiles. It's something different. No, no. But no it, as it should be something different. Yeah, good. Cool. All right, my final choice. Going to go a little heavier here. Um, I also wanted to get a more recent band. I mean, this band has been around for a little bit, but uh, this is, uh, you know, post 2000s. So this is an American band. They're from, shit, I think they're from Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, kind of started out as kind of like a hardcore slash sludge band and then quickly started doing more epic songs and lengths and concepts and their music became very intricate and, they proclaim their love for progressive rock and progressive metal. I'm talking about Mastodon uh, with the first of my choices here, their second album, Leviathan. I remember specifically when I bought this, I didn't listen to their debut. I bought this first and I love the cover and this was getting all sorts of praise in the press and I fell in love with it. A, it's aggressive. It's really heavy, but it's really intelligently put together and the lyrics are great and it's complex and just big, huge riffing and fairly aggressive vocals on this one. Uh, and then after that, they went and did the great uh, Blood Mountain, which took it into even more prog metal territory. And all of a sudden now the vocals are getting much more melodic, uh, but the riffs are killer. The, the lead guitar work is amazing. And the, the drumming is just absolutely off the charts in this band and the bass. Uh, and then possibly the best out of the three, uh, which to me, I think is probably the best album they've done to date, um, Crack the Sky, which is just an absolute classic. I was listening to this today at the gym. And uh, basically after listening to this, I said, I have to pick Mastodon for this today because I had all these other choices, but I was going to go with these guys. And if you haven't heard it, uh, stay tuned tomorrow morning, my review of the brand new album, uh, which just came out recently. So that's coming up tomorrow, but yeah, crack the sky is just absolutely immense. I mean, it's just so epic. It's so complicated and, uh, but in a good way, really listenable and the riffs are just gargantuan on here. And, uh, yeah, I can't recommend these three albums highly enough, uh, blood mountain, crack the sky. And it started off with Leviathan, all great. Paul Romano doing the artwork on all of these. They all, all the Mastodon albums have a similar look and feel due to his artwork, even like the back. I mean, they all kind of fit just absolute works of art. I love this band. Mastodon is my final pick of the day. And all that, that really cool gold ink that they use, right? Yeah, really? it's all, it's, yeah, it's just, look, I mean, you know, you really can't yeah. see it too well here on camera, but beautiful. It's they beautiful. all have just really good, like, lettering and just uh, golds and, yeah, bright and colorful. And, and you know, the backs all have a similar, like, kind of like. My thing. poor bank account. Oh, Paul's, yeah. Paul's a friend of mine. <laughs> and I, I tried to buy the Leviathan cover from him. Oh, was, really? Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's pretty large and it's got this incredible frame on it. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's, piece. that's a beautiful painting. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, it's not for sale. Yeah. But yeah, Why it's incredible. Uh, it's it's a great catalog. I mean, and you know, you could I, I think most people agree these are probably their three masterworks, but I mean, you know, now with the new album, which is this right here. Uh, the last three they've done have been pretty damn spectacular. So, you know, it's a really, really strong catalog, in my opinion. You know, the first album might be a little too brutal for some people because that's, you know, still them at their old style. Uh, and, and The Hunter is a little more mainstreamy sounding, but the rest of it is just really good, intelligent, progressive metal. But it's with a very like American slant where a lot of the prog metal bands, you know, with the exception of maybe Dream Theater and Symphony X are very European sounding. You know, these guys, because they come from that sludge and hardcore background, they're very different from a Dream Theater or from a Symphony X or from a Van den Plaus or Queens record Fate's Warning. You know, they don't sound anything like that really. So great stuff. Great stuff. It's all over 10 years ago. Oh, what an entertaining band to see. Oh, live. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. 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 So there you have it, everybody. Uh, part one. <laughs>
<laughs> part one, the, the first uh, the first epic part of this uh, multi part series. So we'll we'll be resurrecting this in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for uh, some additional bands that had amazing three album runs. So I would say anybody watching, if you're if you haven't heard any of these bands or any of these albums, these are probably easy bets to go out and start your kind of trip down the rabbit hole for any of them. Right. Cool. I was so worried that everybody was going to pick my bands. <laughs> Is it true? We did we only how many how many overlaps do we have today? Where were you? I think only one actually. Only one. Uh, Eric got exactly my three excellent picks. Okay. I think we only did the only had the one overlap. Otherwise, yeah, that's, we were that's all pretty well. Fun. You know what? But if if we hadn't set the rule of none of the the, the big huge bands, we would have all you know there would have been multiple yeah. of us doing that. So yeah. But, yeah, you know, Before I think we, you get, we've talked about those albums and those bands so many times. It's like those are pretty obvious, I think. But uh, yeah. Well, before you gave me that that instruction of like not none of the usual suspects, I already had my three in my hand. Okay, I got this, 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 and then when you told me that, I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> start again, right? But it's a good exercise because like you know you sort of stretch yourself and what you haven't listened to before, right? So yeah, which is good. It's good. And I think you know this this genre of music. Um, there's a lot of greatness by a lot of these bands and you know a lot of these bands went on these runs and you know quite frankly we we could have if i would have said four albums we arguably could have picked a lot of the same bands yes yeah and Probably. and some and even some of the, the bigger bands that we didn't talk about today some of them have runs that are like five six albums where it's just one crazy winner after another so yeah it's yeah. pretty insane so cool all right uh Mr. Porter, you are center square today. Any last words? Um, no, just excited. I was talking to Anthony this weekend, um, and I know he went to see Rail, um, I believe, Saturday, Anthony. And shows are coming back. So I've got Pat Matheny. I've got Consider the Source coming up. I got Steve Vai tickets, and I got my Steve Hackett tickets. So I'm excited. The new Pat Matheny is amazing, actually. Very good. Really good. Yep. I was listening. Yeah, I saw a picture of him playing a strat. Uh, yeah. Well, what is it there? I thought I saw that. Wait, maybe it's on the booklet. Hold on. Yeah, because I do remember there's that. Hold on. No, where is that? Where did I see that? Yeah, because he's not playing the street. He's not playing a strat on here. He's. It's kind of hard to see. But there, there was a, there was something else I saw where he was playing a strat. I don't know where it was, but um, it was a live shot on Facebook. Somebody had. Yeah, then maybe that's where I saw it. Yeah, yeah, which is yeah, yeah, shocking. Yeah. Well, we'll see what he's playing on the nineteenth because I'll be at that show too. So, for those of you watching, if you're in the Albany area, come and uh, meet up with Eric and I on the nineteenth at the was it the Troy Savings Bank? Is that what the place is called? Troy Savings Bank Music Hall. Yeah, I've never been there, so this is a first for me. So. We're gonna maybe go grab uh, grab a beer or two and some pizza beforehand. So uh, indeed, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Ken, uh, any anything exciting come in stock this week that people should head on over to lasercd.com for? To be honest with you, no. It's kind of a. It's actually this is just kind of a quiet week. Uh, we did start taking pre-orders for the new Jethro Tull and Porcupine Tree, but other than that, um, yeah, it was kind of. What about Shopping? the special providence, Ken? We all have to. Oh, go we out have that, that, right? You, know, you want you guys want special providence? We got it. So, <laughs> it's when is the new Jethro Tall coming out? January twenty second, right? Like yeah, it's January twenty eighth. Really? Yeah, it's yellow Jean. Okay, I'm on it. <laughs> I mean, there are some things. There are some cool things coming. The new Cynic album is coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, Ross Jennings from Haken has a solo album which comes out on Friday. Yeah, I think and, those be good. Uh, but yeah, it's actually you know we're getting into that time period really where new releases kind of they just start trickling in. Things yeah, start picking up again. Like, a lot in recent weeks, but yeah, usually it starts to slow down before the holidays. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah but, uh, you know, for those of you watching who haven't ordered it yet, uh, Ken, do you have any of this left? Actually, I. <laughs> it's funny. I just got a handful back in. And I think we have about like three left in stock. Wow. And it, Jesus. They, uh, 
it, yeah, we can't keep it in stock. It's great. Yeah. So for those of you watching, Ken, I'm going to help you sell those last three. Uh, look Thank at you. this amazing, amazing product here. Jethro Tull Benefit, the remixed original album, all sorts of live stuff. You got a blue, was it Blu-ray or DVD? I don't even remember. I haven't watched it yet. DVD, DVD. live in Chicago, 1970. Uh, full booklet, hard. Uh, I mean, you know, it doesn't get much better than this. So uh, head on over to lasercd.com and uh, help Ken sell his last three copies. Can I say one thing? Yes. Um, finally, the, the the tribute album for Norm Need has been complete. It's off to the printers now. Um, all the profits from that are going to be donated to the hospital where they were doing this cancer treatments and just for research. Um, I will let Pete and everybody know how to order it if you want to. It, it's basically unreleased material from bands like Discipline, Tile, Sono Sombra, Mike Coot, Luz Arriada, etc. There's a couple of extras. Rain gave us a song that's not on any of the records. Um, oh. There's a lot of um, different textures and things in the record. And um, it, it would be a really good cause just to, you know, Norm was a person most people don't know, but if you were in Chicago, he was like a central figure in, in the music world, certainly the prog music world that I'm a part of. And it's a, it's a pretty big deal for us. And um, I'm, I just want to say thank you to all the bands who gave us all this music for free so we could do it for this project. And it's been a long time coming. I've, I've been I've been out of the loop for a bit for reasons that have become kind of a, a funny joke, in in um, in the comments. But but um, it's now it's now in the printer, so it should be available very soon for people to order if they if they're curious. Like I said, it's mostly unreleased material, and um, we tried to make it a really good valuable package, just as a remembrance for this guy who did so much for so many bands. This guy was like always looking out for the bands on the road, always making sure we got paid, always making sure we didn't get screwed. So he is a true, true mensch. And I um, I love you, Norm, and I miss you. Sounds good. So we'll have more information on that uh, coming up. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www, I'm going to say it slow today, .c of tranquility.org. My wife says I say it too fast all the time. <laughs> Uh, celebrating 20 years on the internet this year. Uh, and January 1st, I'm going to stop saying that because it'll be 21 years. Uh, also, this is on Facebook and uh, Twitter. But uh, more importantly, we're here on this thing called YouTube all, all the damn, damn time. Time. time for Lewis Nasser, Anthony Ferrara, Armando Venditti, Eric Porter, George Lamy, Stephen Reed, and Ken Golden, I and P. Pardo. See you next week. Good night, everybody. Have a good one. Good night. Good night.